Happy, happy, happy Sabbath to everyone. We're so happy to be here at BMA and having one of our first Sabbath of the last Sabbaths. But we are so happy to have you here. There is a couple of guys who are not here. They are doing the mission in Hamburg Church, and we are so happy that they are there as well. Um, we got a couple of announcements for you today at 6 o'clock. We're going to have an outreach. If you put your name in the list that we have outside for outreach at 6 o'clock, uh, you should be in the parking lot in the cafeteria. We're going to depart from there. And we're going to do the mission as well. We're going to explain a little bit more in there so you can just uh, do the mission as well. So happy Sabbath to everyone. Uh, say the person next to you, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. God bless you. And say the person next to you, you're looking good. You're looking good. I like your outfit. So let's, let's pray together and let's start our service. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much because you give us the opportunity to be together here at BMA and we can praise you. There is a lot of things that we can learn. Uh, there is a lot of things that we can praise you. So please, Lord, be with us, be with everyone who is going to participate in this service, be with the speaker as well. He's given us a lot of knowledge about how the world is going on and how we can manage ourselves as well. Thank you for everything. Bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So now is the time for the health minute. And this is your time. Good morning and happy Sabbath. How many of you guys have heard about the keto diet? Yeah. Um, what are some things you've heard about the keto diet? Yeah. What else have we heard about the keto diet? Oh, she said cut losing weight. Yeah. Um, so yes, losing weight um, is the most popular thing about the keto diet. Um, the keto diet has grown in extreme popularity and is continuously growing in research. Um, today I just want to share a little bit with you about what the keto diet is um, and providing some insight. Um, but before I continue, I do want to preface this by saying that before making any decisions in regards to your health, uh, please speak to a medical professional that can best guide you on your decisions. So, what is the keto diet and where does it come from? In simple terms, the ketogenic diet was founded in 1921 by a physician named Russell Wilder at the Mayo Clinic. Um, according to the NIH, he first used it to treat epilepsy in his pediatric patients. Researchers from Northwestern Medicine break down the ketogenic diet in this way. It's all about cutting carbs and eating more fat. And here's what the daily breakdown looks like. 75% of calories come from fat, such as oils, unprocessed nuts, butter, and avocado. 20% comes from calories of protein, such as meat, eggs, and cheese. And 5% of calories come from carbohydrates, including low-carb, non-starchy vegetables, and a small amount of leafy greens. The keto diet excludes carb-rich foods, such like grains, beans, fruits, and starchy vegetables. Um, a dietitian by the name of Richelle Gomez from the Northwestern Medicine simplifies it like this, quote, your body turns carbohydrates into glucose for energy, and when you cut carbs from your diet, you switch to burning fatty acids or ketones, end quote. When followed correctly, this low-carb, high-fat diet will raise your blood levels of ketones, putting you in ketosis. Ketones are a chemical byproduct that are a new fuel source for your cells. Um, they are the most responsible for the creation of unique health impact on your with the keto diet. It takes about three weeks of carbohydrate elimination from your body to, trans to transition into ketosis. Um, the keto diet has been under speculation for a known number of years, but like many other diet plans, there are pros and cons that come with it. 
Polycystic ovarian syndrome was, ex uh, individuals with polycystic ovarian sy syndrome were examined over 24 weeks under the keto diet. Researchers found that hormone balance was better and ratios between the luteinizing hormone and the follicle-stimulating hormone were lower. When Wilder first started his research, he noticed that the diet reduced the frequency and intensity of seizures in a subset of his patients who followed the dietary approach. Uh, a 2019 review continues to support the hypothesis that a keto diet can support people with epilepsy, especially children, and those who have not responded to other treatment methods. Um, the keto diet may reduce epilepsy symptoms by several mechanisms. Uh, the keto diet has also been found to be safe and a suitable complementary treatment to use alongside chemotherapy and radiation therapy in people with certain cancers. This is because the oxidative stress in cancer cells than normal cells um, causing these cancer cells to die. Just looking at the scale, the ketogenic diet seems like a success, but what happens inside the body tells a different story. Inadequate intake of 17 different micronutrients has been documented in these ketogenic diets, such as vitamins, minerals, and fibers that you get from fresh fruits, legumes, vegetables, whole grains, and so many other foods. Um, the, keto the keto diet is very difficult to sustain um, because of the strict restrictions that aren't sustainable in the long run. However, you can also encounter issues like kidney stones, uh, that can lead to additional kidney diseases. Extreme buildup of fat in the liver and food obsession, we can open the doors for guilt, binge eating, and therefore leading into a toxic cycle. I do want to emphasize there are certain populations that need to stay away from the keto diet completely. Uh, people with diabetes, uh, who are insulin dependent, people who have eating disorders, those with kidney disease or pancreatitis, and women during uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding. While the keto diet may have short-term benefits to a small population, for most of us, it is not ideal and can be harmful. Um, but whenever considering a di the best diet, it is best to consult the Bible, spirit of prophecy, a medical professional knowledgeable in nutrition. I do want to encourage you to be wise in any decision that you make in regards to your health. God has written for us a diet that we should follow in his word and the spirit of prophecy. Be intentional with your research, seek the Lord in prayer, and ask him to guide you in all that you do to his honor and glory. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, in this beautiful morning, uh, we are just going to start our um, worship service with some praises, and um, our first hymn will be At the Cross. Hymn 163.
Our next hymn will be Christ the Lord is risen today, hymn number 166.
Happy Sabbath, church. Laura Lake Kim, over the past three years, 110 children chose to dedicate their lives to, Je to Jesus for the first time at Laura Lake Summer Camp. 104 asked for Bible studies that would read the, to baptism while 62 campers are already preparing for baptism. 176 students, young people, made decisions to rededicate their lives to Christ. Summer camp is a life, changing time for campers and counselors alike. Each time, the young adults and on staff say they themselves most experience God for themselves as they teach children how to pray and read their Bibles during the daily cabin devotions. And it's just one aspect of life-changing ministry at Laurel Lake. Throughout the year, families, young people, and adults attend conferences, retreats, events designed to connect them deeper to Christ in a beautiful, quiet setting Laurel Lake. Laura Lee Camp. Your gift today to Laura Lee Camp offerings enable us to, to provide this setting for people, young and old, to come away, be still, make memories, and discover more about God who loves them so much. Please give generously today and continue to pray for this important ministry as we unite together to fulfill the mission of Laura Lake. Building fund is where you can indicate on your envelope if you'd like to give towards a new air conditioner in the sanctuary. Deacons, please rise to collect your offerings. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you for this week that you have given us. Please help us to finish the year strong, do the best we can, and grow physically, spiritually, and mentally. Bless Laurel Lake, and please help this offering go in your will. In your name pray, amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Today's scripture reading is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, and it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Okay, for this space, um, I want you to find a partner. Uh, so the first thing that I want to ask you is that to your partner, you can ask them the praises and the thanksgiving that they have about this week. And second, some prayer requests. So right now, find a partner, ask them their praises, thanksgiving from this week, and also some prayer requests. And I will give you a time for both can pray about each other, interceding for each other, and then I'm going to end with a prayer. Let's kneel all together for prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the things you gave us in this week. Here, many people is praying right now and giving you praises and thanksgiving also. We ask you for them, for they also, their asylum prayer request. You can be with them, also with a help prayer request, and personal also too. God, thank you for this Sabbath, and bless the, the, the speaker today, that the words that he's going to uh, pronounce, you can be with them, and we can be reached by them. In your name I pray, amen. Can all the children please pick up offering?
We're just going to wait till all of you guys get settled down. So today, our story is going to be about the creation week. And yeah, so does anybody know by heart what happened on the seven days of creation? Well, six, seven, depends how you take it. Does anybody know what happened in the days of creation? Nobody knows. You don't know? You kind of know? What happened on, do you know what happened on the first day? The sun, okay. Do you know? The moon, okay. Do you know? What happened on the first day? The sun, okay. Does anybody else want to try and guess what happened on the first day? The light, okay. So on the first day, God made light. So you guys were really close, but he made light. Yeah, he made light. Boom, yeah. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Does anybody know what happened on the second day? The sky, okay. Yeah, on the second day, God separated basically like the air and the water, let's say, and he made the sky and the clouds. So he separated, he made the sky. He made what we would call like the firmament or the heavens. So he made the sky and air, the air that we breathe, you know, the air that helps us survive. He made (laughs) the sky on the second day. Does anybody else know? I mean, does anybody know what happened on the third day? Like the kids, not like y'all, the MA kids, but like the kids. Do you guys know what happened on the third day? It's green. Plants, yeah. Did you say plants? Oh, you said land. Well, land, yeah, he made land. He made the trees and the flowers and the grass on the third day. And he said that it was good. Does anybody know what happened on the fourth day? What happened on the fourth day? Yep. I forgot. Forgot? Does anybody else know? You know what happened? The star, he made the stars, the moon, and the sun. Yeah. So on the fourth day, God made the star, the, the sun, moon, and stars. There's a little picture. Of, so basically he made space. He made everything. Yeah, our world was here. But like he made the sun, moon, stars, you know, an extension of what he made on the first day, which was light. What did he make on the fifth day? Birds. What else? And fish. So he made the creatures of the sky and the creatures of the waters. So he made whales. Um, there's a penguin on here. He made birds. Yeah. Does anybody know what happens on the seventh day? Oh, yeah, the sixth day. I'm sorry. I just skipped the whole day. What happened on the sixth day? He made the land animals. And what else did he make on the sixth day? And he made us, right? So... In Genesis 1, 26, it said, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And do you guys know what happened on the seventh day? God rested. Yeah. He was he slept. God rested. Yeah. So what I want you guys to take from this is that um, in verse 26, um, and basically every day after God created something, he said that it was good. And it kind of shows us that God made our world perfect. And when he made us, he made us in his image. And God is perfect, right? So um, that shows us that we just have to strive to be more like him and to talk about him and to also take care of what he gave us in nature you know to take care of the trees to take care of the grass to take care of the animals and everything around us um in a way of like respecting and loving what he gave us as a gift does anyone want to pray (laughs) no one wants to pray oh you want to pray okay thank you All right, let's pray. 
Dear Jesus, thank you for this um, Sabbath, and um, thank you that we can um, be here, and please be with um, uh, the people that weren't able to make it today. Um, thank you for creating this world and all the beautiful animals and trees and plants. Um, um, thank you for making us in your image and help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can all go back to your parents now. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful to be in your house. Lord, we just bow our heads and we close our eyes and we rest in you now. Lord, let us lay aside the weak. And any worries or concerns, Lord, lay us, let us lay aside all thoughts except for this thought that Jesus is our Redeemer. Let us learn of him in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the day that Christ, it's the commemoration of the day that Christ rested in the tomb. And... It was the day when there was silence in his life because he had laid down his life for each of us. The hardest day in the life of God, the day that he suffered the most, the day that he, his heart, his noble heart was torn by the thought that he would be separated forever because Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb. Jesus did not know what was going to happen. In the moment of agony when his father separated from him, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know that he's for sure that he's going to come back. He doesn't know that he's going to see his father again. He was afraid that in that moment that the enormity of sin was so great that he would be separated from his father for forever. Now, none of, most of you are not married here. But you know, when you go away from your spouse, your loved one, you worry sometimes, you know, am I going to come back? You know, are we going to see each other again? But when Christ was hanging on that cross, he was not sure. And he had been with the Father throughout eternity. Their bond was like a bond like no other. And he said, no matter what, for your sake, I'm going through the cross. I'm going through it, no matter what, for you. And so, at the conclusion, as Emma was telling the story, you know, about did Jesus rest on the seventh day, did he sleep? You know, the Bible says that Jesus rested after the creation, and that it was his resting on the seventh day that concluded creation. Did you know that? Creation was not concluded on the, on the sixth day. It was concluded on the, sec, on the seventh day. Why? Because that is his commemoration. His resting is part of the creation cycle. And at the conclusion of redemption, he rested in the tomb. We read this morning in our song, we sang this morning, Love's redeeming work is done. Alleluia. Fought the fight, the battle won. Alleluia. Do you believe those words? As you sit here this morning, do you believe that the battle is done? That he fought the fight and that he won the battle? And that Christ has opened paradise for us? I, I have a, a story to tell you this morning 
This talk is entitled The Ransom. What is a ransom? If I ask you for a definition, what would you say? Yes. That's right, okay, and an amount of money that's paid in order to get something in return. So this story, this, this talk is entitled The Ransom, and let's keep in the forefront of our mind what a ransom is. Okay, how do I go back? Oh, here we go, okay. It was August 23rd, 1973, and Life was just like normal in this particular busy city. It was a very busy day. Hustle and bustle. People are shopping. They're going to work. And at the bank, the bank had just opened, and people are going in, and the tellers are there waiting. This is back in the day when there was no online banking. You actually met with a human being, which was awfully nice. We miss those days more and more. And the tellers were there, and the customers were coming into the bank, and a man walked into the bank with a machine gun, August 23rd, 1973. His name was Jan Olson, and he took the machine gun and he pointed it at the ceiling and he pulled the trigger. And he said loudly, the party has just begun. And the police were called, and there was a security police guard on the premises, and he tried to engage with Jan Olsen, and he was shot. They didn't kill him, but he was wounded. And uh, Jan Olsen took four hostages, three women, one man, and he took them into the bank vault. And the police got involved. Of course, immediately there was a silent alarm that was tripped, right? The teller presses the silent alarm. The police became alerted to the fact that there was a robbery going on at the bank. The police come rushing in, and here's Jan Olsen in the bank vault with four hostages. Would you be scared if you were one of those hostages? And Olsen was threatening to kill the hostages. Of course, that's what he's doing. That's why he takes them captive. He's saying, these are my captives. Now, the police chief got involved, and there was a negotiator, and Olsen says, this is what I want. I want the release of Clark Olofsson. Now, he was another bank robber, and he was in jail. And he said, I want $700,000. And he said, I want a getaway car with a full tank of gas. And I want it now. And so the police jumped into motion. And they brought uh, Olofsson, Clark Olofsson, to the bank very quickly. And they said, here's Clark Olofsson. And the two robbers embraced each other, high-fived each other. And then they brought the money, $700,000, just as was, was requested. And then they brought a blue Ford Mustang with a full tank of gas. And they said, we have given you everything that you want. Let them go. And Jan Olsen said, I don't think so. He says, they're coming with me. And the police said, no, they're not. And so Jan Olsen took the four hostages with Clark Olofsson, and he shut the bank vault door, right? You've seen the bank vaults, right? This massive door, and it's a small space, like maybe, I don't know, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 feet. Massive door, and he shuts this iron door, and he is communicating only by phone with the police now. There's a phone in the, in the bank vault. And the police are outside, and they have snipers on the roof. And six days, this hostage situation lasted. Six days, OK? And the whole world was watching for six days. What's going to happen to the hostages? What is going to happen, what is going to, happen to the robbers? The whole world is watching. The news is playing this all the time, 24 hours a day. This is the update on the situation. On the second day, the police chief, he goes in to see the hostages. He says to Ian Olsen, I want to see the hostages. I want to make sure that they're OK. And the police chief goes in to the bank vault. 
He goes into the bank vault and he looks around and a strange thing he noticed. The hostages, they were very warm with their, their, the terrorists, the, the captors. The hostages were the ones who were saying, you know, they're on a first name basis with the robbers. And the police chief is looking and he's saying, are you okay? And you know what they did? They glared at him. They were, they were very distant and cold to the police chief. And the police chief left the bank vault and he says, nobody's going to get shot in there. He says, they're on a first name basis. They're very friendly. It's strange. And instead of being afraid of the captors and the terrorists, the robbers, a strange thing happened. The captors started to like their captors. The captives started to like their captors. They started to like the robbers. One woman, she wanted to call her mother, and the robber says, you know what, go call your mother. So she tries to call, and she can't get through. And the robber says, try again. Maybe you'll get through this time. And she thought to herself, well, this is a very nice robber. He's not so bad. He wants me to call my mother. And one of the captives, she was a hostage. She was claustrophobic. You know what that is? You have fear of enclosed spaces, okay? So they're in a bank vault. It's 30 or 40 feet. She's starting to get claustrophobic. And the robber says to her, you want to go for a walk outside the bank vault? Here. He takes a rope and he ties it around her waist. And he says, go ahead, go for a walk. And he plays out the rope. And so she's able to walk around outside the bank vault. And the police are there with their guns. And she's walking around in front of them to get some fresh air. And you know what she starts thinking? She thinks, this is a pretty nice robber. He let me go for a walk outside the bank vault. And the robbers were negotiating with the police. And the police are saying, let them go. And the robbers are saying, no. And so the robbers say, we're going to have to shoot one of you but we're only going to shoot you in the leg to start with. And one of the hostages thinks to herself, this is a true story. That's not so bad. It's just the leg. I mean, this is a very reasonable robber. And she tried to convince one of the other hostages, just let him shoot you in the leg. It's just your leg. This whole drama plays out six days. Interesting timeline. Six days. And at one point in time, the hostages call the prime minister of the country, one of the hostages. She calls the prime minister, and she says to the prime minister, we trust Clark and the robber. They haven't done anything to hurt us. Let us go with them in the car. They're very nice robbers. And the prime minister says, are you out of your mind? You are not going with the terrorists. But they're nice robbers. Eventually, after six days, the police had had enough. They pumped tear gas into the bank vault, and the robbers surrendered. And the police said, come out with your hands up to the robbers. And the robbers were about to go out of the bank vault, and the hostages said, no. We're going first and with you, because if you go first, they'll shoot you. And this phenomenon became known as Stockholm Syndrome, where the people who are taken hostage fall in love with the captor. Does that sound familiar to any of you? This world is in captivity. This, this world is a prison planet, in fact. And it is held hostage by Satan. And some of us, in fact, it is the human condition because we grew up in slavery. This is all that we've ever known. We have gotten awfully comfortable with the robber. Is that not so? The ransom for you has been paid. Did you know that? The ransom for you and for me has been paid. The question is, is do you want to be free? Now, if you will open up your Bibles with me 
we're going to examine some texts. This is 1 Timothy 2.5. Thank you so much for the scripture reading this morning. Thank you for the beautiful music uh, and the, the beautiful children's story. You guys are blessed to have beautiful music here. And this was read here this morning. I want to read it again. I want to draw your attention to something interesting. Look at this Bible verse and notice who is mentioned. Okay, let's read it carefully. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man and men, the man Christ Jesus. How many parties are mentioned there? Okay, three. Who are they? Okay, God, one party, right? That's one person. One mediator. Okay, that's Jesus Christ and men, humanity. Three parties, right? Three parties. Do you notice who's not in there? Who's not in there? Satan is not in there. Did you know that governments around the world, many governments have a policy that they do not negotiate with terrorists? Did you know that? And so if you are traveling in foreign lands and you are taken hostage, somebody takes you with gunpoint, at gunpoint and they lock you up and they make a ransom demand for you to your parents or to your government, the government in that country and the government here will say, we do not negotiate with terrorists. Why? Because it encourages terrorism. You can see why that would be the case because anybody who travels into one of these countries and is taken hostage and then gets paid off, it just encourages people to do the same thing, right? And so the governments have a policy that says, we do not negotiate with terrorists. Do you know why Satan is not in this picture? Why he's not in this verse? Because God does not negotiate with terrorists. Satan is a terrorist. And God does not negotiate with terrorists for your release. This is between you and God. And he is speaking directly to you this morning. On the day that Christ rested in the tomb, or the day that we celebrate Christ resting in the tomb. And he says directly to you, do you want to be free? Do you want to be free? This isn't about Satan anymore. Satan is beaten. Satan has been defeated. The victory has been won at the cross. Jesus Christ says to you personally as you sit here this morning, do you want to be free? Because the ransom has been paid. He laid down his life for you. And he comes to you personally and he says, my son, my daughter, come with me. Come with me and be free. Who did he give himself a ransom for, according to the text? Who did he give himself a ransom for? Just you? Just you? Or everybody? The ransom was paid for every single person on this earth. Every person who's sitting here in this room, every single person out there in society, every person that has ever lived, the price has been paid. The ransom has been made. The question is, is do you want to be free? God does not negotiate with terrorists. When Satan took humanity hostage, God is not negotiating with Satan. He comes down instead and he pays the penalty for sin because the law was broken. And so God in the person of Christ comes down and he says, I am paying the debt. What's your name? Your name. Yeah. What's it? Say it loud. Edson. I am paying Edson's debt. I am paying his debt for him. Who does he pay it to? Some people say, well, he pays it to Satan. No, he doesn't. The payment is not made to Satan. So who is the payment made to? The payment is made to God, by God, because God is the one who established the law. It's a transcript of his character. It's like you as a parent, when you're a parent saying, you can't do this, and if you do, you're going to get a punishment. 
And instead of punishing your child, you, tell your, you take the punishment on yourself. Or you go through the punishment for your child, with your child. The payment has been made. And God does not negotiate with terrorists. Jesus is the mediator between you and the Father. We talked a little bit this morning about lawyers. Jesus is your advocate with the Father. He is your judge and he is your mediator. And he says to you this morning, there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. This is directly between you and God. How many of you want to be free? Romans 3.26 says, At this time God declares his righteousness that he may be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. How is God just? What does this mean? How is God just? How can God be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus? Have you ever thought about this? How is he just? When you break the law, what is justice? Justice. It's the penalty falling on you, right? But God says, I can be just because the penalty was taken by Christ on behalf of humanity, in the place of humanity, as the representative of humanity. That justice may be satisfied. All justice is satisfied at the cross. The payment for all the sins that you have committed or ever will commit was made at the cross. I tell this story sometimes about some of you have credit cards. I hope you're responsible with them. You have a credit card? You put money on it? Okay. Let's consider for a moment that you have a credit card and you run the debt up to $500 million. And the interest rate, there's some flaw in the system, okay? And you can... You can charge as much as you possibly want. And the interest rate is 22%. What is the interest rate per month on $500 million? It's way more than you can ever gather probably in your whole life. And every month you send in your $100 to the bank and the bank is like, are you out of your mind? $100? We're foreclosing on your house. We're foreclosing on your life. Your life is over. $100. You owe, us, you owe us $10 million a month. I'm not a mathematician. Maybe it's $100 million a month. I don't know what it is, okay? But it's, I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. But the thing is, is that the bank is saying, your $100 is meaningless. You attempting to work your way into God's favor is completely ineffectual. Did you know that? The foundation of all false religions is that you will work your way into God's favor. You will do your penances. You will say your Hail Marys. You will go on your pilgrimages. You will worship the statue and give so many alms to the priest. You will walk up, up, the, statue, up, up the chapel on your knees. All of this is completely ineffectual. It is the equivalent of you paying $100 a month on a $500 million debt. It is nothing to the bank. They're foreclosing on your whole life. Okay, you can see the circumstances here. Now, hopefully none of you are in big debt like that. Debt is a terrible thing. Imagine one day you are worrying about how you're going to provide for your family, how you're going to pay your car payment, how you're going to do everything that you need to do. And a notice comes in the mail, and it says somebody has unilaterally made the payment of your debt. So your, your, your debt is with... Wells Fargo. How many of you? No, don't put your hands up. Okay. Wells Fargo is your bank. You owe Wells Fargo $500 million. And a notice comes in the mail and it says somebody has paid your debt. What clears the debt? The payment or your belief in the payment? What's the answer to the question? Somebody brave? The payment of the debt has 
been made for you. Do you believe it? What do you do with the liberty that has been bought for you? Does it bring you to repentance? Do you say, I want Jesus? He paid the debt for me. Or do you say, I want the robber? When Jesus was there before Pilate, who did they want? They wanted the robber. Satan whipped them into a frenzy and said, ask for Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. What shall I do with Christ? Pilate says, crucify him. Crucify him. I find no fault with him. It doesn't matter. Crucify him. Shall I kill your king? We have no king but Caesar. We want to go with the robber. On this day we commemorate the son of righteousness, the God of the universe, laying down his life for our sake to buy us back. You know, the Israelites had Stockholm Syndrome. They grew up as slaves 400 years in the land of Egypt, and all they knew was slavery. And God has to come down because they are completely incapable of delivering themselves. God comes down and he says to them, I am here to rescue you. And God does not negotiate with terrorists. And Pharaoh says, I'm not letting them go. And God says to Pharaoh, you are going to let them go. And Pharaoh says, I don't recognize your authority. And God says, I'm the God of the universe, Pharaoh, and you are going to let them go. And I'm going to put this in common words. Pharaoh says no. And you know what God says to Pharaoh? He says, I'm going to mess you up. I'm going to mess you up, Pharaoh. Because you are going to let them go. Because I do not negotiate with terrorists. And Jesus says the same thing to Satan today for you. Do you want to be free? Do you want to be free from sin? The plagues come to Egypt. Pharaoh says no. And God says, that's not enough? Here's another one. Are you ready yet? No, I'm not. Here's another one. And when Israel is let go from Egypt, they are thrust out by the Egyptians. They don't deliver themselves. God himself delivers them. And the Exodus chapter 19 verse 4 says, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. I messed them up for you. He destroyed that country for the sake of the children of Israel, to buy them back and to bring them out. You know, e Egypt was the world's superpower at that time. And there was a conflict between the world's superpower and the God of the universe. Who do you think won that contest? Who do you think going to win the contest when that is repeated in the future? The Bible says, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for you, Sheba for you. So Jesus gives himself and he gives this country to rescue the people who want to be free. And he's asking you this morning, do you want to be free? Or do you want to stay with the robber? Now, the Ten Commandments begins with these words. I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's how the Ten Commandments begin. That's part of the Ten Commandments. This is the first part of the Ten Commandments. If you take this out of the Ten Commandments, you misrepresent the character of God. Because he comes down and he delivers you. He draws you out of Egypt. And he says, I know you're used to being a slave. All that the Israelites knew was being slaves. All they, in, 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 in extrapolating that word, in, in uh, explaining that word, typologically speaking, they were in sin their whole lives. And we are in sin our whole lives. And God comes down and he says, you know what? I know that you're in sin. But I'm here to rescue you. Come with me. 
We are going to the promised land. Do you want to come? And Israel isn't sure that they want to go. We like Taco Bell and Burger King and whatever it else it is. We want all the stuff that's in Egypt. Yes, we're slaves. Okay, we're slaves. But we get to eat garlic. And they're like, we don't want liberty. And Jesus says, I know your mentality because that's all you know, but you don't know what you're saying. Come with me and let's go on a journey. You know, it's steps to Christ. It's a journey to the promised land. But you have to put yourself in Jesus' hands and say, I want to go. I want to go because you bought me and you laid down your life for me. A lot of times this is how you see the Ten Commandments portrayed. I was at a church recently. This was how they were portrayed on the church. You know what's missing? This. This is what's missing. If you put this up here without this, you misrepresent the character of God. You slander the name of Jehovah. Because he is the one who came down to rescue you. And he rescues you first. What, what comes first, redemption or repentance? Redemption comes first. You have been bought back. Why does it say, you shall have no other gods before me? Because nobody loves you like Jesus does. And you don't know that. Because he rescued you and he died for you and he bought you back. Because nobody loves you like he does. And this is the same for every single one of these commandments. I am the Lord your God who has brought you out. Jesus has brought you out. He has bought you back. Isaiah 44, 22 says, I blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions and as a cloud your sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed you. Some of you might feel like you're far away from God this morning. I did this, I did this, I did this, I can't go back. I've been up and down with God. I've fallen away. I can't come back again. And Jesus Christ says to you this morning, he says, come back to me. I have bought you. I have redeemed you. Don't stay away. Don't stay with the robbers. Come back to me and be free. Christ's object lesson says, we have been redeemed by a costly ransom. Only by the greatness of this ransom can we conceive of its results. On this earth, the earth whose soil has been moistened by the tears and blood of the Son of God, are to be brought forth the precious fruits of paradise. In your lives are to be brought forth the fruit of redemption. God ransomed man. Satan was the hostage taker and he was going to be in control unless somebody stronger than Satan came to the field and conquered him and ransomed man. You know an angel wanted to ransom you? An angel wanted to ransom you. An angel wanted to pay the debt. And an angel could not pay the debt. Why? Who can pay the, pay the blood price of the people who have been taken hostage? Only somebody with the same kind of blood. The blood of the creator flows in his creation. And he is greater than Satan. And he laid down his life to buy you back. And you have been bought back. You have been ransomed. A lot of us think to ourselves, you know, unless I'm good, I can never be bought back. I am, God is not going to do anything for me until I do X, Y, Z. He ransoms you first. Like we have Stockholm Syndrome. We have a distorted view of God because of sin. We have to earn his favor. You do not earn his favor. The debt has been paid. The question is, Jesus says to you, do you want to be free? Do you believe the debt has been paid? I bought you back. We won't read this whole quote, but it says that there are people who go forth to labor as the ox or the horse goes. So they get up in the morning and they go to their job, just like the horse or the ox or the donkey. And they take, they have souls so precious that rather than permit them to be hopelessly lost, the Son of God gave his life 
to ransom them, but they have little more appreciation of his great goodness than have the beasts that perish. So there is a world out there that has been ransomed, and they don't even know it. Somebody has to tell them. Human beings are Christ's property, purchased by him at an infinite price, bound to him by the love that he and his Father have manifested for them. You have been bought with a price. What is this? The story is told of a man who is going to a garage sale. And at the garage sale, he's looking at the various odds and ends and the different items, and in the back of the garage, he sees a tarp covering something. And he says to the homeowner, he says, what's under the tarp? And the homeowner says, that's an old motorcycle. And he says, is it for sale? No, it's not for sale. Well, I want to see it. Well, it's not for sale. Well, I want to see it. Fine. So he pulls the tarp back, and there's this old motorcycle. Not the exact motorcycle. This is a picture. Old motorcycle. And the man looks at it, and he says, I want that bike. He says, how much do you want for it? The homeowner says, it's not for sale. The man says, everything is for sale. How much do you want? And he says, I'm not selling it. He says, I'll give you $300. It's not for sale. I'll give you $500. The bike does not work, but I'll sell it to you for $500. So he takes it and he rolls it up into the back of his pickup truck. He figures he'll work on it with his son. Kind of a father-son project. And He's going over the bike, he's looking at the parts, he's looking, I need this part, I need this part, I need this part. And he says, I better call Harley Davidson because this is a bike from the 1950s and 60s or 60s, I, I, I'm not even sure what year it is. So he calls Harley Davidson and he says, I've got this old motorcycle, and they said, okay, what year, make, model. So he gives them all the information he has, and they say, we, we can help you. What's the serial number on the bike? So he goes to the garage and he writes it down and he goes to Harley Davidson on the phone and he says, the serial number is X. And there's this long pause. There's this long pause and Harley Davidson says, we'll get back to you. A couple days later, the phone rings and it's Harley Davidson. And it's the manager and the manager says, we understand you have a bike with such and such a serial number. I do. We'll give you $150,000 for that bike. Sight unseen. And the man says, is this a joke? And he says, no, sir, this is very serious. This is Harley Davidson. He says, I'll call you back. He's not sure. I guess we don't do this anymore. We just press the button, right? Back in the day when this story is told, they did this. You don't even know what that is anymore. <clears throat> a couple days later, a celebrity, well-known celebrity, calls this man. He says, I understand you have a bike with such and such a serial number. He says, I do. And he says, I'll give you $500,000 for that bike. And he says, why? What's special about this bike? And the celebrity says to him, go outside in the garage and lift the seat and see if there's anything written there. So he goes out to the garage and he sees these words written under the seat. And he comes back to the phone and he says to the celebrity, there's two words written on the, underneath the seat. The king. And the celebrity says to him, now you understand. Now you might not know what this refers to because you're too, you're too young. But that bike belonged to the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. And I want to tell you this morning, you belong to the king. And that is the truth. And you might be rusted up and not run, but he knows how to fix you up. And he bought you back. And this morning, you belong to him. The question is, is do you believe it? 
The question is, is do you believe that the ransom was paid? The question is, is do you want to be free? I'm supposed to end at 12.30. I'm going to go over five minutes. I hope that's okay. In Exodus chapter 11, the Hebrew people were told, let's look there, let's go there. Exodus chapter 11. When you're there, just say amen. Exodus 11. Pardon me, Exodus chapter 12. They were told to take a lamb of the first year, a male. And they were told that in the first month of the year, on the tenth day, that they would take it into their house. Verse 3. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Every house had to take a lamb, just like this. And it had to be without blemish. And for three and a half days, approximately, that lamb lived with the family. They fed it from the table. Their kids played with it. They loved it, and they got to know it. And at the end of that time, the father of the household had to take that lamb and kill it and take the blood from that innocent animal and put it on the doorposts of the house so that the angel of death would pass over. And that is the meaning of this this is the meaning of this, of this day. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world to buy you back. And Jesus Christ, when redemption was finished, rested in the tomb. And your work as a Christian, your life as a Christian does not begin with your work. It begins with your rest. We have a distorted view of God that I have to work to earn his favor. No, his favor has been given. And you need to rest in his favor. Did you know that on the first day, full day of Adam's life, Adam was created at the end of the sixth day, the first day of Adam's life was the seventh day of creation. He begins his life with rest. And that is where the gospel starts. Too long you have thought and we have thought that it begins with work. But Adam rested in the completed works of God. Creation was finished. It was a gift to him. His first day, he rested in the righteousness of Christ. And that is the invitation for you. For every single person in this room, listening to the sound of my voice on this day, Jesus has bought you back. And you can rest in his righteousness. Matthew 27 verse 9 says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value. He gave his life a ransom for all of us. And we are told to never, never finish a talk like this without asking you to make a stand for the person who bought you back. If you want to stand up for Jesus, because he stands right now in the presence of the Father on your behalf, stand with me now.
We're going to sing our closing hymn. It's hymn number 152. Let's pay special attention to the last stanza of the song. It sounds like there'll be, if it's okay if we sing that story at the beginning of the next talk. Uh, they have set up Mighty Fortress with the praise team, so we will still experience that song All right, in that's a fine. little bit. Thanks. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we stand here before you, a nation, a group, which has been bought back. And Lord, there has been so much apostasy and sin, and Lord, a distorted view of you. And many people, some people maybe even in this room, think that they cannot come back to you. Lord, let that thought be banished in this moment. For Jesus Christ has ransomed all of the captives. Let us give ourselves to him in this moment and be renewed and recreated. In Jesus' name, amen.
You may be seated. Thank you so much for that. We praise the Lord for the message that we heard today, uh, about the ultimate price that was given for us. And I'm so excited that we can meditate upon that for till the ceaseless ages of eternity. I just wanted to make a quick announcement that at 3.45 p.m. we'll be back here. And there's about 40 of you that signed up for our outreach around 6 p.m. to about 7.15. And so you're also going to be, uh, we'll be meeting in the cafeteria parking lot right after your supper time. So we have, I think, about room for about 40 to 44. Um, we're going to be counting the list, and we're going to be looking at that list. And we can't go over that because of supervision and also room on the bus. So uh, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Have a blessed Sabbath day, and we'll see you very soon. God bless you.